I wasn't raised in a Christian home, so we have that in common. We, I did not know Christ for most of, or all of my youth, all of my young adult years. And, um, but, uh, you know, like, like you, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not Caucasian and being in America, we are a minority. So uh, I wrestled with my identity, but I also wrestled with something that I kept secret. I didn't tell anyone, you know, Asians, we are very private. We don't talk about uh, personal matters, especially issues of sex or sexuality. So I, the first time I remember having same sex attractions when I was when I came across pornography. And the interesting thing is, you know, you would think, oh, you know, it must have been one of your American friends who 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 gave you pornography. Actually, it wasn't. It was one of my trusted uh, family friends, friends of my parents. My parents had no idea. The father kept it hidden in the in the bathroom. I was friends with uh, their son, and I just found it. You know, nine years old. I, you know, that's it was. I know parents, you know, if you're listening now, you might be devastated, but we have to realize in our age of internet, pornography is everywhere. And if there's internet in the United States, there's internet in India. And if children, whether it's on the computer or whether it's on their phone, are have this powerful tool in their hands that can do good, but there's also a lot of harm to it as well. And so I would really urge parents, if you are listening, or even if you're a young adult, to be very wise and careful with the internet intake that we have. If you have a child, I, you know, I mean, it's maybe not the same thing in India, but in America, uh, you have little kids walking around with their own cell phones, uh, smartphones. And uh, to me, I don't think that that's necessary. I think Children just need a flip phone, you know, something very, very simple, and they don't need access to the internet at any moment of the, of the day. But anyway, so I was exposed to pornography at nine years old, which is actually, though young at that time, I'm, I'm 50 years old, so I was born in 1970. So at that time, that might have been young. I don't, I don't think so, because I think that's, that's kind of, kids are exposed very young, and especially today, they're being exposed even younger because of internet and also because of parents just allowing children to be to have access 24 hours a day on the internet. We really need to limit that, I think. Uh, but so I was exposed to pornography. I didn't tell anyone, kept my feelings hidden. I definitely didn't tell my parents. Kept that hidden through high school, college, Marine Corps reserves. Uh, I came out of the closet. I was going to dental school. My father's a dentist and I was wanted to pursue being a dentist. So I was pursuing my doctorate in dentistry. I was in my 20s at this time. I was, I'm from Chicago. I, li I was moved to Louisville, Kentucky, which is central in the United States uh, in the South. Fairly conservative, but it was then that I came out of the closet, as, as we say, as I said back then. I told my parents, and amazingly, this is the best part, Rajat, that my, through that crisis, devastated my mom and dad, but it brought my mom to faith. Well, I wanted nothing to do with what I saw as crazy religion. You know, who's this God? Who believes in that? And especially I thought, well, Christians hate gays. And, and I thought, well, this is who I am. So Christians hated me. So I rejected their re religion. I thought they, you know, lost their mind. And I, at that time, I kept doing what I knew how to do best, which was have fun. You know, if you don't have God, then you might as well have fun, live it up, party with my friends. And I did that. I began experimenting with drugs. And, and I, I need to make this clear because sometimes people think that I'm saying that everyone who's gay or lesbian does drugs or promiscuous. Not necessarily true. Some do, some don't. But that definitely is part of my story. And I just have to tell my story and you know, talk about God's glorious work in my life. But I began experimenting with drugs. But if anyone would guess, drugs cost money. So I actually supported my habit by selling drugs while in dental school. I sold to friends, classmates, even a professor. Well, eventually I was expelled from dental school. I moved from Louisville, Kentucky, further down south to Atlanta, which is around the southeast uh, in Georgia. And at that time, I kept doing what I knew how to do best, which was sell drugs, have fun. And I began supplying drugs. This whole time, my parents had no clue that I, that I was doing drugs, but they knew that my biggest need was not to stop doing drugs because they didn't even know, know I did that or stop partying. They knew even my biggest problem was not my sexuality. They knew my biggest problem was that I did not surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. 
So they began to pray for a miracle. Um, well, actually, they came to visit me one time in Atlanta, and I told them to get out. I, it was so bad. I mean, I, I hate to think about this, you know, because, you know, Asians, we're supposed to respect our parents. But in my mind, I kept telling myself, I'm not Chinese. I'm, I'm American, which is so funny how Satan likes to twist things. So I, I rejected them. I, they came to visit me. I, I kicked them out. And uh, my dad, before he left, gave me his Bible. And as soon as they left, I took my dad's Bible and I threw it in the trash can. That's how much I despised God and the Bible. And after that visit, it was so obvious to my parents that I was hopeless, completely unreachable. But my mom and dad committed not to focus upon hopelessness, but upon the promises of God. And along with over a hundred prayer warriors from their church, from their Bible study fellowship group, they began to cry out to God for me. My mom began to pray a bold prayer. God, do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to you. For, for an Asian mother, that's a scary prayer to pray. But she was desperate and she enlisted over a hundred prayer warriors to, fa to pray and fast. She fasted every Monday for seven years, once fasted 39 days on my behalf. She would literally spend hours every single morning in her prayer closet, reading the Bible, interceding for me. I mean, it was, she knew there was going to take a miracle to bring this prodigal son to the father. And a miracle is exactly what God did. That came with a bang on my door, opened up my door, and on my doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police, and two big German shepherd dogs. So I received a, a, a shipment of drugs, not my largest, but they confiscated my money, my drugs, and I was charged with the equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. So I was called, uh, I found myself in jail and I called home just thinking, I'm gonna get an earful for my mom. But my mother's first words were, are you okay? No condemnation, just words of unconditional love and grace. A couple, couple days after that, um, I was walking around the cell block and I passed by this garbage can and I thought, this is my life, trash. I've destroyed my life. I bent over and, and, I, and I thought, and there was something on top of the trash. I picked it up and it was a Gideon's New Testament. I took it back to my cell, began reading it. And at first it wasn't good news. It wasn't giving, making me happy. It was actually bad news because I'm a sinner. And it was telling me I've sinned against God. I've sinned against my parents. I sinned against my, the, the government. And I was like, what is, what's the good in this? Well, things got worse. I was called to the nurse's office and the nurse gave me the news that I was HIV positive. So I was devastated. And one night I was found myself in my cell all by myself. And I looked up at the metal bunk above me. It was all, you know, it was cold metal. And someone had written, if you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. And God used those words written to a prophet thousands of years ago to condemn a rebellious nation, Israel, that was in rebellion, in exile, to tell me that he could still have, God could still have a plan for me while I was in prison as a rebel. And I didn't know where that plan was going to take me, but he gave me enough faith and enough strength to get through that one day and the next and the next. So my transformation was gradual. God, God was convicting of my sin, obviously drugs, but within a few months, he, he delivered me from that addiction. God kept bringing to mind other idols, and there was one that I felt like I just couldn't let go of, and it was my sexuality. So I went to a chaplain, and I asked him his opinion. And to my surprise, the chaplain told me, oh, the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality. Gave me a book explaining that view. And so with much curiosity, I took that book in the hopes of finding biblical justification for homosexuality. I had that book in one hand and the Bible in the other. And Rajat, let me just tell you, from a purely human perspective, I had every reason in the world to accept what that book is claiming to justify the way I had been living. But I know now that it was God's indwelling Holy Spirit that convicted me that, that is, those assertions from that book were a clear distortion of God and His Word. I couldn't even finish that book and I gave it back to the chaplain. So I turned to the Bible alone. I went through every verse, every chapter, every page of scripture looking for anything that would bless a monogamous same-sex relationship. I couldn't find any. So I was at this turning point and a decision had to be made. Either abandon God and his word, live as a gay man, pursue a monogamous same-sex relationship by allowing my attractions to dictate not only who I was, but how I lived. Or 
abandon pursuing a monogamous same-sex relationship by freeing myself from my sexuality and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. My decision was clear and obvious. I followed Jesus. As the days and months of abstinence passed, I realized my sexuality shouldn't be the core of who I, who I am. I told myself before, God loves me unconditionally, and that's true. But as, sinner, as a sinner, I, I, I like to add to God's, God's word. And, and, and you know, we often add to God's word, which is wrong. And I told myself, so therefore God doesn't want me to change. But I realized that actually unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. My identity shouldn't be defined by my sexuality. My identity shouldn't be grounded in my desires. My identity is not gay. It is not ex-gay. It's not even heterosexual for that matter because my identity as a child of the living God must be in Jesus Christ alone. God says, be holy for I am holy. You know, I thought that the option of homosexuality was heterosexuality, that somehow that was the goal to be heterosexual. But as I studied it more, I realized, first of all, that's not even a word in the Bible. Also, it's a secular concept grounded in Sigmund Freud's philosophy. And I thought, this is not the goal because being heterosexual, I could be sinning even as a heterosexual, heterosexual sin. So I realized that heterosexuality, it's the correct direction, but it's too broad and not specific enough about God's holy intention. God never com commands us be heterosexual for I am heterosexual, but neither did he say be homosexual for I am homosexual. Instead, God says be holy for I am holy. So therefore, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality, but the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. As a matter of fact, the opposite of every sin is holiness. I don't need to focus upon whether I'm struggling, whether I'm tempted, but I need to focus upon living a life of holiness and living a life of purity. Because change is not the absence of temptations, but change is the spirit wrought ability to be holy even in the midst of temptations. Because the ultimate issue is not whether I'm struggling or tempted, but the ultimate issue is that I yearn after God in total surrender in complete obedience. So after a few, uh, about a, you know, some time passed in prison, I realized that, that God called me to full-time ministry. So I, I applied to uh, Moody Bible Institute. Actually, God shortened my sentence from three years, six years to three years. I applied to Moody Bible Institute um, and I was actually uh, accepted. I, uh, I was released from prison in July of 2001, started the very next month in August at Moody, and then went on to my master's and finally my doctorate and then wrote my first book, out of a far country with my mother and then the second book uh, or my uh, actually my third book uh, called holy sexuality and the gospel